Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, the president walks back his threat to shut down the border, his new warning to Mexico if the flow of drugs and migrants continue, and the border businesses watching the debate unfold. Plus, the rubber hits the road on San Diego's commitment to climate change, one father's mission to make North Park safer for bicyclists. Also, a new musical at the Old Globe explores loss and love through a teenager's eyes. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Good evening. It's Thursday, April 4th. Thanks for joining us. I'm Susan Murphy. Mexico is still on notice as President Trump appeared to ease up on his threat to shut down the southern border. He told reporters at the White House today that Mexico has one year to stop the flow of illegal drugs coming into the U.S. If the drugs don't stop, Mexico can stop them if they want. We're going to tear off the cars. The cars are very big. And if that doesn't work, we're going to close the border. So we're doing it to stop people. We're going to give them a one-year warning. And if the drugs don't stop or largely stop, we're going to put tariffs on Mexico and products, in particular cars. The whole ballgame is cars. The president plans on visiting the border in Calexico tomorrow morning. Yesterday, San Diego County sued the Trump administration to stop immigration authorities from quickly releasing families after they cross the border. Relief organizations say they are struggling to help feed and house migrants. They warn a public health crisis is taking shape. In San Diego, at the country's busiest land port of entry, tens of thousands of people cross the border every day to go to work, school, see a doctor, or go shopping. Their lives and the regional economy would be interrupted if the president moved forward with shutting down the border. KPBS border reporter Jean Guerrero has the story. More than 100,000 people cross the border daily through San Diego and Tijuana and the cities exchange more than $4 billion a year. President Trump has floated closing the border to address the unprecedented number of families applying for asylum in the U.S. So we're going to have a strong border or we're going to have a closed border. President Trump subsequently backed off, giving Mexico a year to solve the crisis or else. Threats to close the border are scaring people here. San Diego's hotels rely on workers from Tijuana. Americans who can't afford San Diego housing live in Tijuana while commuting to work. Wealthier Mexicans send their kids to private school in San Diego. And San Diegans who can't afford health care in the U.S. go to doctors in Tijuana, such as Bertha Herrero, who lives in San Diego but has a dentist in Tijuana. And I came here because it's cheap or cheaper <laughs> in Tijuana than in San Diego, no? Herrero is seeing a dentist at the first Mexican HMO to be licensed as a health care provider by the state of California. SIMSA offers medical and dental services to Americans. But in Tijuana, President Frank Carrillo says dozens of people canceled their appointments this week because Trump's threats to close the border made them afraid they'd get stuck in Mexico if they crossed. It's just the threats alone. Just that, that in itself is already creating a problem. People, people don't want to make a trip. Carrillo says the HMO employs about 500 physicians and treats between 1,500 and 2,000 patients a day. He says closing the border would be devastating, not only for his business, but for most of the people he knows. We're dividing families by doing this. So, so really no, nobody wins in this, in this situation. Nobody wins. Many local residents live as if the region were a single place. San Diego and Tijuana are really one metropolitan area. Even though there's a, a border between us that separate us uh, geographically and politically and all this stuff, we are one community. Lucila Conde works at a San Diego nonprofit that installs solar panels for low-income families. Hi, this is Lucy at Great Alternatives. How can I help you today? But she has a house in Tijuana and cares for sick relatives over there. We have 
commitments and and relationships on both sides. I have a I have fam a family member who is on dialysis in Mexico, and she requires uh, help and attention. Every morning, dozens of new asylum seekers arrive at the port of entry to put their names on a wait list. It takes weeks to be called to speak to a U.S. customs officer because of the long backlog. Most are from southern Mexico and Central America. Some come from other areas. One woman who's been waiting since last month is from Cuba. If they close the border, I don't know what's going to happen to us. She asked for anonymity because she fears for her life. When a human leaves her country, her culture, her habits and roots, it's because she must. Because the saddest thing in the world is be a migrant. People humiliate you. They mistreat you. Back at the medical practice, Carrillo says that as much as he fears for his business, he fears for asylum seekers too. These people are fleeing poverty and violence. So, so the, the answer to this problem is get, go, go to the root of the problem. The root of the problem is there. He says the U.S. should help people in Central America. But President Trump recently announced plans to end all aid to Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador as punishment for failing to stem the tide of migrants. Jean Guerrero, KPBS News. The massive baby Trump balloon that made headlines around the world will be floating above the sky in Calexico tomorrow during the President Trump's visit there. San Diego activist William Johnson says he wants Trump to see the baby in a diaper balloon up close. The balloon really should just kind of follow him wherever he goes um, because he needs to be reminded at every, um, at every waking moment uh, what his disposition is really like. Johnson protested the administration's policies at a news conference last May when he used a megaphone to interrupt former Attorney General Jeff Sessions. Why are you here? Are you going to be separating families? Is that why you're here? We'll have, we'll have more on the president's Calexico visit tomorrow night on air and online, kpbs.org. Teenagers as young as 15 will be able to pre-register to vote in California if a bill being debated in the state legislature continues to advance. The author of the bill says teens who pre-register will be far more likely to cast ballots when they turn 18. The bill cleared a legislative committee hearing at the Capitol on Tuesday. If enacted into law, California would set the youngest pre-voter registration age in the nation. This is really a broader part of a package that we're pushing where we're actually looking at lowering the voting age even to 17 in the state of California. Um, I think the next generation deserves a voice and this is one shot at uh, fixing that. There are currently more than 300,000 16 and 17 year olds pre-registered to vote in California. The process is handled through the DMV's embattled motor program. The agency admits to tens of thousands of voter registration errors last year. Some lawmakers report teenagers who were pre-registered to vote received actual ballots. The San Diego Fleet football team season was cut short after the league that owned it suspended operations this week. KPBS reporter Matt Hoffman says while the team is done, the city of San Diego is still owed money. And so now it's like we have to say goodbye to each other. Yeah, too. Yeah, so yeah, it's goodbye. sort of like it's a, we're all family here, you know, yeah, so oh yeah, we're saying, uh, you know, goodbyes to the guys. It's um, so obviously, you know, it's a little bit emotional, you know, because uh, that bomb was pretty close. Former players we talked to say they have gotten their final paychecks. Some were here today at SDCCU Stadium cleaning out their lockers and saying their final goodbyes. But at the end of the day, you know, um, eight weeks of, of film of pay um, as, a, as, a, as an NFL free agent. Um, it's, uh, the, it goes a long way. So, uh, so you just have to look at it from, uh, from a higher perspective, glass half full. Uh, just got the In addition to the fleet's former punter, Sam Irwin Hill. The whole, uh, whole locker room stuff right there. We ran into former kicker, Donnie Hageman, who was taking home the rest of his gear. It was a good group of guys and a good coaching staff. And uh, you know, we had a lot of fun here. Um, obviously, it was the first year. Um, first time for, for the AAF and um, short 
short-lasted, but uh, it was good. It was good while it lasted. The Fleet were part of the Alliance of American Football League and played four games at SDCCU Stadium this year. The stadium is owned by the city of San Diego, and according to an agreement to play there, the city charged $100,000 in estimated expenditures plus $25,000 in rent per game. According to a city spokesman, the city has not received any of the estimated $400,000 in game day related expenses and has not yet been paid rent for two games. Ticket sales were supposed to go to the team, but the city has withheld that money to cover operating expenses. A spokesman says it's a common practice to keep ticket revenues to cover expenses incurred by tenants. You know, obviously we wanted to be able to finish out the season, just two more games. Um, uh, so, you know, we feel we feel bummed about it just, just like everyone else. And... Um, you know, it's unfortunate, but, you know, that's a business sometimes. Between ticket sales, parking, and concessions revenue, the city says it will make a profit from fleet football. Matt Hoffman, KPBS News. KPBS reached out to the Alliance of American Football to see if it was planning to pay the city, but have not heard back. San Diego's Climate Action Plan made an ambitious pledge to beef up safe infrastructure for bicyclists. But the city's track record isn't great. Numerous bike projects have been delayed or watered down. From the KPBS Climate Desk, Metro reporter Andrew Bowen says one father in North Park is hoping to reverse that trend. Okay, you want to put your helmet on? Matt Stuckey is helping his four-year-old daughter, Kate, with her bike helmet. Okay, Kate, ready? Can you look at me? Kate sticks to the sidewalks, but Stucky's seven-year-olds, Blake and Luke, are fine on the streets. All right, you want to follow me? That's because the streets here are quiet. But venture over to 30th Street, North Park's main north-south thoroughfare, and it gets a lot less safe. I think there's some people, uh, maybe middle-aged men, who are comfortable riding there and, you know, between the buses and speeding cars. But if we want to expand the number of people who are riding bikes, uh, especially kids or older people, uh, they need protection to be safe on 30th Street. San Diego is currently replacing an aging water main that runs underneath 30th. After that's done and the street is resurfaced, Stucky wants the city to redesign it with protected bike lanes, the kind with a physical barrier separating cyclists from moving cars. He says a lot of people drive to the businesses on 30th because cars feel like the only safe option. But I think they want to transfer those trips from the cars to their bikes and go with the family to go out to dinner or to get ice cream or uh, even with their friends to go get a beer. Uh, so I think there's a lot of people who are willing to make that change and want to make that change and be more active, but they are only going to do it if it's safe. I have a five-year-old and I have an infant, so I would want to have as safe a facility as possible that made me feel comfortable as a parent going with my kids. City Councilman Chris Ward got city staffers to analyze the bike lane design options. Protected lanes are feasible, but they may require eliminating on-street parking. Ward says he's taking feedback on what design residents prefer. You try to find that balance, but the good news is that we're already being proactive on looking for uh, parking modifications on some of the off-streets uh, that, that, uh, cross, that cross 30th Street as well. So the community that choose to drive and park won't feel any net impact, but at the same time, we'd be able to actually be successful and get new bicycle lanes. Parking in North Park can feel difficult, but there's a parking garage on 30th that's about two-thirds empty most of the time. The Neighborhood Business Association, North Park Main Street, voted to support a painted bike lane option that would keep most on-street parking. The group's executive director, Angela Landsberg, says her board members are wary of drastic change. And so there's some hesitation because the evidence from their eyes is that there's just not enough people riding bikes to warrant that, uh, the elimination of all of those parking spots. At the same time, Landsberg says if the city replaces street parking with protected bike lanes, maybe that wouldn't be so terrible. I think that the studies have shown that if you build protected, safe bike lanes, people will use them, and also that that does benefit business in those areas. So there's data to support that. It really is completely focused on the kids. On the one hand, Matt Stuckey just wants to be able to take his family on a safe bike ride to go get ice cream. But on a deeper level, he sees the potential redesign of 30th Street as a test for San Diego. Which does the city care more about? The convenience of driving or fighting climate change? We were inspired by what the city did when it passed its climate action plan and committed to reconsidering how we live. And I think as a parent, uh, we, I need to be 
doing everything I can to make sure the city lives up to those commitments. Stuckey and other advocates are organizing a group bike ride on April 13th to drum up support for the safest design possible. Then on April 16th, the North Park Planning Committee will discuss options. Stuckey will be there as a member. Last month, residents elected him to a seat on the Volunteer Community Planning Group. Andrew Bowen, KPBS News. Your future cast showing us that wet weather continuing into tonight across San Diego County that will continue to inch closer into Oceanside, San Diego, making its way inland as we head into the nine o'clock hour into Borrego Springs and Mount Laguna and then into midnight. Really not talking too much in terms of wet weather going to be faint with the showers, but clouds definitely abundant and then you can see some pop up activity into the seven o'clock hour, but really clouds the main things that we'll be looking at for tomorrow. As we talk about tonight, you're dropping down to 50 and Oceanside. 58 for San Diego and 57 in Borrego Springs, a low 40 in Mount Laguna and getting into some of that shower activity. Now tomorrow, less chances for shower activity, but rain will still be coming uh, down heavy in towards Sacramento. So if any plans there, expect some travel issues. 75 in Oceanside for your Friday, 70, uh, 67, uh, excuse me, 65 in Oceanside. We will be warming up here, but not just yet. 67 in San Diego and 76 in Borrego Springs, topping off at 49 in Mount Laguna with clouds still very available. Weekend comes along, sun going to be thriving as well as hot conditions. And here's a look at your coast into the 70s for Monday, out towards the deserts, definitely feeling that heat into the upper 90s on your Monday with lots of sunshine. Reporting for KBBS News, I'm your meteorologist, Dodgy Aswad. Back to you. Three recent heartbreaking suicides involving student survivors of the Stoneman Douglas High School shooting and the father of a girl killed at the Sandy Hook School shooting have sparked conversations about how to support people after horrific tragedies. Joining me is Dr. Christina Huang, a clinical health psychologist at Sharp Mesa Vista Hospital. Dr. Huang, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me, Susan. How does trauma continue to impact a person after an initial traumatic event? Mm. You know, we define trauma as something that's so horrific that it changes the way that we understand ourselves, how we relate to other people, and how we stand in the world. So oftentimes after a trauma, our outlook on life can become very bleak. We can start to avoid everything that reminds us of who we were with, what it was like at the time of the trauma. We can start to isolate and withdraw. We can start to have flashbacks and nightmares where we become very terrified of the experience that we had. Our memories can affect us. And so oftentimes when our outlook becomes very bleak, we can get to thoughts of death and even suicide. Okay, and though these thoughts are very seem very hopeless, mm -hmm. your message tonight is that healing is possible. So if yeah. you could just tell us some of the steps mm -hmm. of therapy that mm -hmm. you would advise people who experience trauma. To. Absolutely. I think the main thing with whatever the trauma is, whether it's a sexual assault or a tragedy, is that we lose our sense of power and control and predictability. So regardless of what form of therapy we engage in, it's always important to get that sense of empowerment back. And that's how we get that hope back. One of the most important things with treatment is support. We're not meant to go through this alone. And I think a lot of people who are dealing with a trauma want to isolate, want to be alone. They don't want to talk about what's what they're going through. But that increases their social isolation and their thwarted belongingness. So it's very important to be around people, to talk with people, to help validate the experience, the fear, the hyper arousal that comes with it. Group therapy is always a really good way to go, but support groups, support systems, friends, family members are also a really good way to go. There's also a lot of alternative ways to deal with it, yoga, um, adjunctive therapies like equine therapy, but the most important theme is to get back that sense of empowerment. Okay, and these services are offered at Char Mesa Vista Hospital? Yes, those, most of them are, not the equine therapy and the yoga that I talked about, sure. but in terms of the group therapy, we have a lot of different programs that can address different types of trauma. Okay, mm -hmm. and if you could just tell us, what are the warning signs to look for yeah. if a friend or family member has experienced a traumatic event? Absolutely, usually we're looking for pretty significant changes, right? So if a person starts isolating, if they start using substances, if the mood changes, the face changes, if they start withdrawing, maybe they stop talking to friends or family members, they start sleeping in too much, or they don't sleep at all. We're also looking for if they start talking more bleakly, thoughts of death, listening to dark things, those, you know, very simple changes that we can look for. Okay. Dr. Christina Huang, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. 
I'm Judy Woodruff tonight on the NewsHour. Mueller team concerns over Attorney General Barr's public conclusions from the Mueller report. Coming up at 7 after Evening Edition on KPBS. I'm out of words. A new musical at the Old Globe explores the mess and beauty of loss and love. It's told through the eyes of a 16-year-old girl. KPBS Arts Calendar editor Nina Guerin introduces us to the playwright and director. Life After is a new musical by an extraordinarily talented Canadian woman named Britta Johnson, who wrote the book, music, and lyrics to the show. Uh, and it is a sweet, terribly moving story about the coming of age of a 16-year-old young woman um, against the backdrop of the loss of her father in an accident. And as she comes to terms with the grief that has overwhelmed her, she starts to make some connections about her life and finding her own voice and finding a path forward. I wrote the book, the music, and the lyrics. Yeah, I wrote the whole thing. I did all three jobs because I didn't know any better. I started writing it when I was 18. I didn't really realize that it's usually <laughs> three different people. And that's just kind of how the piece started to grow. But for this particular show, the music and lyric and text scenes all kind of weave together in a very particular way. It's very music heavy. The music really drives the story. So I'm primarily a composer in the rest of my life. But for this kind of music driven piece, it makes sense for me to wear all the hats. But I truly just didn't know any better. That's why it happened. <laughs> what once was black and white is turned to gray, all different shades so strange and I looked at the show and I said to myself and my, the staff here at the Globe said, wow, we haven't seen anything like this. Um, the, the tone of the piece is really rich and complex because on the one hand it's a story of grief and loss, but on the other hand it's a story of a kind of quirky 16-year-old. And as the father of a preteen myself, I know that the connections that happen in a teenage mind are um, very, very idiosyncratic and surprising. It's a story of a, an, of, a, of a very, very deep, uncommonly deep bond between a father and a daughter. So personally, that's where I connected with it because my daughter is the apple of my eye and the light of my life and all those other things. And contemplating the horrible notion of me not being there to see her grow up just moved me and touched me very, very deeply. This piece isn't at all autobiographical. It isn't my family story, but I lost my father. And that is something I share with the lead character and that my father passed away when I was 13. So the seeds of it, at least, the way that it feels, the way it sounds, the the central questions of it. I think I was pulling from, from questions I knew about asking, and then it expanded into a universe that's, that's pretty far from my own. But uh, I think the, the core of it is, is some kind of truth that I can relate to. And that I think we all can relate to because loss is one of the most universal things. It's, it's a guarantee that we're all going to go through it, you know? I've always just thought that we should say things how we see them. One of the things that's really important about this story is that it's about a, a young woman. Um, the musical theater, sadly, regrettably, is just doesn't tell a lot of stories about girls and their growing up. Handful here and there, but not a lot. So the first thing that really made us pay attention to this was that it's, it's a story written by a woman and about the journey of a woman growing up and dealing with this thing and that was that was really really important to us. The foundation of it remains the same but it's it's expanded exponentially in its scope and its scale and it's the scale of its vision. The team here, the creative team is absolutely incredible, world class and collaborating with them have has turned it into a piece I never could have imagined on my own and it's the largest stage my work has ever been on. So the, the core of it remains exactly the same as it always has been, as it's been since I was 18, but it's, it's grown in scope, in scale. Life After runs at the Old Globe until April 28th. Now here's a recap of tonight's top stories. President Trump is easing up on his threat to shut down the southern border. He told reporters today that Mexico has one year to stop the flow of illegal drugs coming into the U.S. The president plans to visit the border in Calexico tomorrow morning. 
Tens of thousands of people in San Diego would be affected if the president moves forward with shutting down the border. The San Diego Tijuana region has the busiest land port of entry in the country. The city's exchange would more, more than $4 billion a year. The threats are bringing an increased amount of uncertainty for people whose livelihoods depend on the open border. San Diego's Climate Action Plan made an ambitious pledge to beef up safe infrastructure for bicyclists. A San Diego father is hoping the city will build protected lanes for cyclists on 30th Street and North Park. Some say not enough people are riding bikes to warrant the elimination of parking spots. The North Park Planning Committee will discuss their options this month. Here's a look at what we're working on for tomorrow in the KPBS newsroom. On Morning Edition, a major shift. The Mormon Church rolls back controversial policies toward LGBT members. And on roundtables, suicide prevention on the Coronado Bridge. How recently installed bird spikes are just part of a strategy to reduce deaths. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thank you for joining us. Have a great evening.